All right, here we are again today on I Catch Killers, and uh, we've changed the uh, format somewhat uh, today. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately, it might not be that bad. Um, I'm the person being interviewed, and uh, today I've got the very, very experienced journalist Claire Harvey going to throw some questions at me to get to find out a little bit more about myself. Hi, Gary. Oh, hi, Claire. <laughs> it's very nice. It's exciting to be out of the house and seeing you in person. Um, although we are maintaining strict social distancing, I see. Exactly. <laughs> we, we can't afford to break any more laws. <laughs> I'm the deputy editor of the Sunday Telegraph, and uh, so that means Gary and I are now working together um, in Gary's new capacity as an investigative journo. Um, which has already been fantastic for us. Um, your story is being published across News Corp Australia and we've made this podcast together as, uh, as the big showpiece of your work with us and you're working on a book. So how have you found the transition to journalism? Are you, uh, are you enjoying it? I, I am enjoying it, but uh, it's been a uh, sharp learning curve. Uh, certain skills that have uh, come across from uh, being a detective for as long as I have uh, are transferable into the world of journalism. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging. But uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And drinking before noon is a feature well, of your journalistic work. When uh, you decide <laughs> for a career change at my stage of life and uh, you think, what can you do? And to... Uh, Work in an environment where you start drinking at 8 o'clock in the morning and talking to some <laughs> friends is a, a pretty good gig, so I shouldn't complain. So we've been recording the I Catch Killers podcast at a great pub around the corner from where we work called the Keg and Brew in Surrey Hills. And uh, to to sort of make things run smoothly and also to be polite, I think, to the pub owners, you know, we couldn't go there without buying some beers. Exactly. Um, exactly. I've been supplying schooners of VB to you and your detective friends while you talk about, um, about uh, gruesome crimes and funny cop buddy stories. Um, um, and I think it's helped. Do you, do you think it's uh, it's aided the, the conversation to have a few beers under the belt? Most definitely. I know when we first talked about this podcast and we we're going to record it in the studio and uh, I don't know, it might be the cop in me, but uh, the moment I get into uh, a studio or have a camera pointed at me, I, I tend to uh, tense up about yeah. it. So sitting in a pub environment with a beer in front of us is an environment that uh, most detectives are very comfortable with and I think that played out. As long as we don't uh, have too many drinks, I think that's there's a fine <laughs> yeah. line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there a lot of you know off duty drinking uh, in your in your work as a cop? That that was kind of the vibe that we'd thought. You know, we wanted the podcast to capture, which is two detectives who've just knocked off sitting down at the pub and having a beer. Did that actually happen, or was it more about filling in timesheets and 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 m- moving on? No, there, there's certainly a culture, and uh, probably more so in the early part of my career that uh, drinking was a a big part of it but I I think that was across the board in society and uh, we've toned it down a little bit the uh the long lunches that turned into uh, uh, dinners are, are no longer, but uh, there still is a way that uh, we like to have a, have a drink after uh, after a big job to um, de stress and uh, yeah just un- unwind a little bit. Um, it's certainly and uh, yeah these things can have the detrimental effect, but I think it's uh, healthy in the environment that we work in and the pressure of mm. major crime detectives that uh, you do have uh, have an outlet and uh, yeah sometimes. <laughs> I think I got my first job in journalism because the bureau chief wanted someone to have lunch with, have a long boozy lunch with, <laughs> and nobody else would do it. So, um, you know, at 18, I found myself um, in Chinese restaurants drinking with the 50-year-old bloke who, who just actually wanted someone to tell his war stories to. Was that the same as a young cop? Uh, I, I, I cringe when I look back at the amount of Chinese restaurants I've, <laughs> I've sat in and, uh, yes, we'll have another serve of honey prawns and uh, <laughs> another round of crown lagers. Uh, yeah, it just seemed to be the Thing. And uh, I, I, and you talk about the difference between uh, policing and um, and journalism. There is a, that common theme that uh, it's invariably if you find a group of uh, coppers in a in a pub having a drink, you're going to find a group of journalists having a drink as well. It yeah. just seems to be part and parcel of it, and it might be part of what we see and deal with and, and the pressure. Mm. Uh, so yeah. What changed was it the advent in journalism? I think it was the advent of um, of women basically who would rather be at yoga at yep. lunchtime than in the pub getting sweaty. Yeah. Um, what, what changed in policing? What, why doesn't that happen so much anymore? Look, I think there was a, a cultural cultural thing. There, there's a detrimental side to a culture that uh, embraces uh, embraces drinking, and I, I don't think it's unique to police. I think it's across across the board in mm. uh, in society. So we we just had to tone it down a bit. We're all a little bit more accountable these mm. days, and uh, so yeah, I think it, it, it's changed along those lines. They were good days, and uh, I'm glad I went through them. But in the same regards, I'm glad I'm not uh, not now. I don't think I could do the long lunch followed by the long dinner followed by some 
um, sleazy nightclub yeah. at two o'clock. And would morning. you then get called back to, to work? You know, was this were there occasions when you you would have all, you would all be at the Chinese restaurant and you'd get called back to. A case or yeah, there, there a has be, has been occasions. Obviously, uh, level of intoxication uh, play, plays a part, but uh, it wasn't unusual pre uh, mobile phone days that uh, when uh, we were out at the pub or whatever that we'd leave the number at the uh, at the police station mm. if anyone's after us, um, contact the the bar at such and such. So uh, yeah, I, I I do remember quite a few times being called called back to work uh, from from the uh, hotel. Mm. So you were an eighteen year old. Apprentice, weren't you? When you when you you had the idea to join the cops? Yeah, I was uh, I was an electrician. I, I didn't really have um, yeah, like most uh, kids at that age, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't have a, a clear path. Um, I knew the building industry. I'd worked in the building industry for whilst I was at school, and uh, I sort of fell into that. So I was an uh, apprentice electrician, and I had a particularly tough day. I was up in a ceiling, crawling round in the in the hot ceiling and the dust and uh, dirt, and uh, I was having lunch in a park at Ride, and I saw uh, two uniformed cops chasing a uh, crook down the street, and uh, I looked at that and thought. That's a, not a bad idea. And really, it was from that moment, and it wasn't, I hadn't even thought about joining the police prior to that. Um, it was from that moment I just sort of said, yep, that's what mm. I'm going to do. And uh, I applied the next day. Wow. And was it easy? Did they take you straight away? Or? Uh, I think there was a 12 month waiting list right. at that, that point in time. So it's, uh, but yeah, the, the application went in the next day, and then I just had to go through the uh, processes and uh, found myself uh, um, down the uh, police academy at Goulburn. Uh, mm. Within 12 months. And then once you graduated from the academy, where did you go? I went to uh, Hornsby uh, Police Station, which um, on the uh, north shore of Sydney. Um, it was a good police station in that it covered that there was a transport hub there, so there was a bit of work around the railway stations and it, it had a good um, cross section of work. There was a rural area. Um, actually, the first uh, station, because you get buddied when you, uh, you come out of the academy, and uh, my buddy worked out of um, Barara and they had a call box, which I don't know if people even understand what a call box was, but it was about the size of a telephone box and it was on the side of the Pacific Highway. And that was actually my first police station, and that was to um, my detriment because my fa- um, uh, friends paid out on me a great <laughs> deal that that was the police station I was working at. It was, was it, so you had to stand in it? Or you would because we didn't have phones. You yeah. had radios, yeah. but you had a, uh, a hotline in the call box, and oh. it was literally you walk into a telephone box. It looked like the TARDIS off Doctor <laughs> Who, and uh, it was could only fit two people standing right. in there, and that's where we did some work yeah. in the uh, in the call box. Yeah, yeah, strange and then, times. And then you moved into um, armed hold-ups. Was that was it shortly yeah, after that? Yeah, b- before I uh, went into armed hold-ups. So in the cops, you've got to do uh, two years in uh, in uniform. And then uh, at minimum two years, which is give you your skills and, and that, uh, general duties, police officer. Then uh, I got invited to detective's office, which was a way of things in those days. You, you didn't... The detectives were too intimidating. You didn't want to walk, rock up and say, hey, I want to be a detective. Mm. But I got a tap on the shoulder by someone and said, uh, after two years, why don't you apply? And then uh, I went to Hornsby Detectives. You get a, a temporary position there on the A list, they call it. And that's where they get to assess you and you determine if that's a lifestyle you want. And uh, uh, they were happy with my work. And then I got a permanent uh, spot at Hornsby Detectives. Stayed there for a couple of years and then... Uh, I got a tap on the shoulder about um, if I wanted to uh, go to the armed uh, armed hold up squad, a secondment to start with, and again that's like a, a test test mm. run to see if you're suited. I was wrapped when uh, that came along. It's uh, I enjoyed my time in general duties. I enjoyed my time in Hornsby, but uh, the blokes at major crime or men and women at major crime, I looked up to them as uh, as legendary. And uh, then uh, I was uh, invited to uh, come across. Mm. So that was an experience in itself going across to the armed hold up squad. And so did you have to invest in a in a flared flared pants and a tan suit? I'm I'm envisaging Roger, you know, like vintage Roger Rogerson kind oh, of shotgun. The, the, the suits were classic, <laughs> even the sports coat. We could we could pull off sports coats like you wouldn't believe, and they were generally cheap sports coats because they're uh, police and we didn't earn a lot of money. But uh, no, there was a, the fashion fashion sense, and I look back at, at some of the things that we we wore in those days, and I just cringe. You know, the short sleeve shirt and the tie, and uh, yeah, it was a it was an eclectic mix of uh, of fashion. But being a uh, detective, 
And you didn't want to buy the expensive suit because you can guarantee the first time you buy an expensive suit, you're going to be wrestling with a crook on the ground mm. and you're going to tear your suit. Mm. And, uh, that happened to me so many times. Mm. So I think that's why detectives traditionally, we, we buy the uh, the wear and tear, wash and go type, type <laughs> suits. But um, No natural fibres. No, <laughs> exactly. Um, fashion statements, um, when I first came in the plain clothes, a lot of the old timers were wearing the uh, shoulder holster, mm. which was, uh, I thought looked pretty cool. Mm. I, I had a shoulder it's a holster. Untouchables, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's something, Elliot Nest, yeah, mm. it, yeah, the shoulder holster. So that sort of carried something. It was, it was, it was strange going from uniform in the plain, plain clothes because in uniform you're so identifiable and you mm. walk out on the street and you know people are watching you and everything and then uh, to go there, there was a sense of freedom going mm. into uh, plain clothes g- going in, back into uh, you could blend in with the civilians and mm. it was a good feeling what sort of gun did you have at that at that stage uh, we had a 38 Smith and Weston right um, we've uh, uh, I think it was about 10 years later we went to a Glock and uh, the Smith and Weston was uh, the revolver and uh, and yeah. where did you keep the ammunition for it you had a, a, a pocket in your belt, or you right. just kept it in your uh, in your uh, um, pocket or on your your belt. But there was only six rounds there, and actually we got um, we all got upgraded after uh, two uh, police officers were killed up at uh, Crescent Head. Mm. There was a shootout um, up there, and uh, they were vastly undergunned mm. with uh, with having the revolvers because they were a, a good weapon. They were light, but mm. they you only had the six rounds, and then we got the uh, Glocks that uh, carried mm. a lot more rounds. And, mm. uh, and then would you carry a spare cartridge for the Glock as well, or, or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you had um, 30 or so rounds. Mm. So it, it made it, it. It's amazing seeing young cops now. I saw a couple walking along the beach the other day, you know, d- telling people to go home who were sitting on towels. Um, and they're so weighed down by their belts. You know, there's so much gear on yeah. a cop's belt now. Oh, uh, look, I, I feel... Sorry for um, young uniform police now in all the all the options and uh, all the tactical options they got. They got they got the OS spray, which is a, mm. a, a capsicum spray. Um, they got tasers. They got the expendable uh, expandable batons. Um, when I came out of the academy, you had your revolver on your your hip and you had a um, yeah twenty two inch I think it was steel baton mm. and. Uh, so if if you had to rely on those, it was pretty a pretty simple option. But mm. now there's so many, and under a pressure situation, uh, so many tactical options that they, they've they've got there, which I understand the need to bring them in the um, ones that aren't uh, lethal force. But it does make it a lot harder. I. I, I preferred the simplicity of just having a bat and a gun mm. and uh, your fists if you needed it. Do you think that made cops less likely to draw a weapon? You know, the fact that they, they only had essentially lethal force or a baton, but, you know, was it, was it, did it mean that they had to be more, um, more, more thoughtful or more quick on their feet? Yeah, look, and it's an individual thing and I, I never judge anyone in a tactical situation because you're, you're making a split-second decision under extreme, uh, extreme pressure. But I felt comfortable with that because when you're under that pressure... You've got to react. It's got to be your natural instinct. And, uh, yeah, I draw my gun many a time whilst I'm, I'm working, but it, it's something there's... Once you draw your gun, you, you're really up in the ante, so mm. to speak, and so if you could avoid drawing your gun, mm. uh, it was good, but once you've, you've drawn your gun, it, you've sort of backed yourself into a corner to mm. a degree. Uh, with the baton, I think the mere... Sound, and we were taught that the sound of a steel baton coming out of a steel ring is very chilling. It's mm. steel on steel, and I, I know um, because I did some time in the uh, tactical response group as as well, the riot squad, and I know it's a very intimidating sound when you're drawing a, a, a um, metal uh, baton from a, a steel ring and just the sound of it. So mm. intimidation, um, yeah, and but I think. Yeah, and this is just my view on it. Society's changed a little bit. There was more respect mm. uh, for the police. Now, whether that re- respect was coupled with fear, because it was, uh, you know, you hear the stories of old style policing and the, you know, the young hoodlum getting a kick up the arse and sent home. Um, now, society is more readily uh, prepared to question the, the authority of the police, and I think mm. it, it's very difficult. And uh, I think another uh, thing that's uh, made it difficult for young cops is um, everything they do is basically going to be captured on camera. And uh, all, all recorded. 
<laughs> don't, don't laugh when I say record. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, you are laughing. I'm laughing. Um, but, yeah, that is the way of the world these mm. days. So everything you do, you're going to be accountable. And I think of some of the things that uh, I was involved in and did when I was a younger police officer, not that it was anything untoward, mm. but I'd be embarrassed to see myself play out. Now, any time that police turn up, mm. someone's going to pull a camera, uh, uh, their phone out and yeah. start recording it. And yeah. I think that adds, uh, adds pressure. As a young, as a, you know, 18-year-old or 19-year-old, out of the academy, you know, how do you acquire that? How did how did you or do young cops acquire that kind of natural authority to, you know, to stop a brawl or to to um, calm someone down who's 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 violent or stop a domestic in, that's going on? You know, what do they teach you about about asserting yourself? And, and, and yeah, it, it, it's it's funny. Um, and I know the first time I came out of uh, out of the academy, the first day at work. I um, at Hornsby in uniform, and uh, I walked across the highway. And it was I was walking across the highway in a don't walk area, yeah, or right. not the pedestrian crossing, and all the highway stopped. Wow. All the cars stopped mm. because, and I had to check myself and realise I'm a police officer now. Mm. They thought I was out to stop the traffic, so. You become aware of that. You become mm. aware that when you step out in uniform, people are, are, are looking at you. In terms of the power that you've got, I think that's where, uh, and you've got to be so careful with it. And I have concerns that, um, and not criticising, there's some very good police officers that have come straight, straight from school into the police. But I, I like having that little bit of life experience. Mm. Um, I think the fact that I spent uh, four years on a building site uh, before I joined the police made me uh, more understanding of what authority is and how to use it properly. I think when you come from school, uh, you leave school in uh, you know, year 12 and you're the top dog there at school and then you come out in the street, you're in a police uniform and you're top dog again and you've got all this authority and I think that can um, yeah, uh, cause problems. Mm. But if you've got good mentors in the police, and that's how I learnt, like they can teach you the basics in the academy but when you come out... You're very fortunate if you've got someone or surrounded by people that are good operators and smart people. I, I think you try and take uh, take the lessons from the people that you see actually do the job. And I, I saw it in uh, I saw it at work. Yeah, there were some sergeants in the charge room, and you'd be amazed what goes on in the charge room when someone's being dragged off the streets. They're angry. They're spitting venom or actually spitting or wanting to fight everyone. And you see a sergeant. Uh, the, an experienced sergeant can de-escalate it, mm. um, still got the authority, controls the situation, de-escalates it, and also has compassion and em empathy. They're the type of police officers I wanted to be. Mm. You see others that when you know, some dropkick is uh, seen in the charge dock threatening to fight everyone, the cops are escalating it. I think mm. the good cops are the ones that can de-escalate it but still maintain the authority. It but, sounds uh, like parenting. <laughs> yeah, well, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about that analogy, but that's very much like parenting because quite often you know, you, you're seeing in the police, and I, I think this is what makes a job interesting, you're seeing people at their, their worst mm. um, and best, but uh, at their worst, and they're misbehaving and sometimes they you know, need a little bit of chastising like you would with, uh, with your children mm. and uh, put them back in their, their place. One of the most popular episodes so far of I Catch Killers has been you talking to Jason Evers, your yeah. long-time homicide partner. Um, that friendship and, and kind of... It's almost like a sibling relationship, isn't it, that you yeah. guys have on the road. And do, do, do all partnerships kind of have to work if you get partnered with someone who you don't really like or yeah. you know what happens if if it's not really working oh, if it's not working going to work becomes very unpleasant mm. um especially in in homicide because you are so working so close uh, close to uh your partner um yeah I, i've been fortunate uh, the majority of my career i've always enjoyed the, the people i work, mm. work with and everyone brings a little bit of something different mm. into it but especially when you've got jobs away, like if you, um, and I'm not naming names or, or saying this actually occurred, but can you imagine <laughs> being stuck in a car with someone, travelling for eight hours and then working with that person for uh, eight hours, 10 hours, 20 hours or whatever, and then going back to a motel and, mm. and hanging with that person <laughs> then doing the same thing over and mm. over again? Mm. So, yeah, if you've got the right person, it makes it makes a world of difference, just makes the pressure, makes everything enjoyable. And with, with Jason, like nine years he was my work partner and that's pretty astounding in, in homicide. I don't think there's many or any partnerships that have, have been that long. And we were the odd couple. Um, 
Jason might allude to the fact that I'm a little bit serious. Others might have, might agree. I always thought I was funny, but uh, <laughs> Jason pointed out that I'm very boring and that he's got to try and liven me up. So we used to hit um, some crime scenes and uh, sometimes when the briefing and it's first impression, so it could be a country police station or wherever, being called to a murder scene. And for a large portion of the time I was working with Jason, I was a sergeant and I had uh, Jason as a senior constable and Nigel Warren, uh, a good friend of ours. And uh, we used to hit hit the uh, strike force or the investigation team. And at the first briefing, we'd point out that Jason's a funny guy, I'm a serious guy, <laughs> and Nigel's a nerd. But together, we combine and make a good team. <laughs> Superpowers. So, um, yeah, some some of the the funny thing, and we put shit on each other. Yeah, and you can see that. And yeah. that was sometimes we got serious. There was one time we. Um, drove from, I think it was uh, Coffs Harbour to Sydney and we didn't talk to each other the whole trip. And, Who was driving? Well, here, here in lies where the story started. We were out, um, uh, we'd been away for a couple of days with our informant, uh, Mr X, that uh, we've referred to and that's stressful in itself. And it didn't go as well as we'd hoped. The investigation we were on so we were stressed and we hadn't had much sleep. And I was driving and we pulled in to get petrol and a bite to either the cafe and... Uh, I was, Jason was reading the paper and he read something out to me and I said, I want to read that when I'm not driving. So that's how the argument <laughs> started. I don't know how it escalated from there. He would say I'm in the wrong. I would say he's in the wrong. But we got to round about Port Macquarie and we decided we're not going to talk. So I thought, stuff this, I can outlast you. And he felt the same thing. <laughs> when we got down to um, near Newcastle, there was roadworks. I was so tired, but I was too proud to tell Jason I'm too tired to drive. I was prepared to run off the side of the road, kill, in, both. <laughs> kill yeah. us both in preference to <laughs> say I'm too tight. So we got to a stop sign on the highway and we, we stopped there and I stopped and then I fell fast asleep at the car, at the <laughs> wheel and the only words that we spoke the whole trip was Jason said, uh, I think I'll drive. I said, okay, and we got out, swapped seats and then drove all the way to where we had our cars parked at the Bennett Hills and didn't talk. So oh, That's great. We're proud of that one. That was a good fight. And then you had six months of not talking, didn't you, after Barrowville? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had um, – Barrowville uh, took its toll on uh, mm. all of us and uh, I, I referred to it or we've referred to it and it was the murder of uh, three Aboriginal kids and mm. that's where Jason and I first um, – uh, started working together. So it was uh, Clinton Speedy, Colleen Walker and Evelyn Greenup and uh, we became involved in the reinvestigation and uh, it really, it, it got to us. There was racism mm. and, and all sorts of things that the, the families, the response by the police could have been could have been better and response by everyone. You know, people just didn't care. They're a marginalised group of, group of people. Um, we worked on that for about, uh, well, 10 years. We were, we were pushing, up on, uh, pushing up on that and... Uh, we finally got one of the matters to trial, and this was, I think, 2006 um, at Port Macquarie. Um, a person was charged with the murder of um, Evelyn Greenup, and that was, you know, we were excited about that. We had a lot of um, pressure from the community, um, from the families. We felt like, you know, they put their trust in us, we'd got it to trial, and uh, the verdict came back not guilty, and uh, it just ripped the heart and soul out of both me and Jason, and uh, we went after the verdict came back we went uh to a community hall with the uh, community and there was a lot of tears and uh, a lot of um pain and uh sadness jason and i didn't talk for about six months after that and uh we we'd now discuss it and i just didn't want to see him and he didn't want to see me i think mm. it was because we uh, each other reminded us of what we'd been through mm. and it was just too difficult for us to 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 deal with but uh yeah, it was not. Um, it wasn't a falling out as such. It was just that it was too raw and too too painful for us to talk talk about. Mm. So, one of the thing when when we we first started talking probably a year ago about uh, about us hiring you and coming to work with us at the Sunday Telly and News Corp and doing a book with Harper Collins, I kind of thought of you in my head as you know the cop who doesn't play by the rules but does get things done. Yep. And what I've come to learn about you is actually you are the cop who plays by the rules, you know, and yeah. that, that's very much a part of your character. Um, if, funnily enough, one of our senior executives wanted me to call the series Dirty Gary. 
I said too okay. soon. No, okay. I, I, I see the humour in too it. Too soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's because you were um, up, on, up on charges for recording a, um, a person of interest uh, um, on your mobile phone. And yep. that's why everyone in the podcast is sledging you about, about recording. Yes. <laughs> you, you can see how the, uh, the, the, the cops, my colleagues, are uh, looking at it and uh, opportunities to take a shot at me. All in good humour. All in yeah. good humour. Yeah. Look, I, I, I don't know. I'm not talking about this right at the moment. I'm talking about other things, but you know when you've done something stupid and it's so stupid people don't even pay out on you? Yeah. That's more worrying yeah. to me. Like uh, the fact that they are joking about mm. it. Um, uh, we made reference to Angelo Mamolo's send-off and uh, that was the first and only police function I've been to in the last 12 months and a lot of senior police there, a lot of people there, and the common theme was um, that I would be recording the whole thing, <laughs> so let's not worry about uh, getting pictures or, or whatever. Yeah. But that that's good, funny uh, humour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad they're talking about it because, mm. uh, you know, as I've said, I'm I'm not ashamed of, of what I did. I accept the court has ruled against me mm. um, on uh, on a breaching on the Surveillance Device Act, but I always maintain the reason I did it was I was protecting uh, uh, the I had concerns and I was protecting my uh, my lawful interests. Mm. So, yeah, what am I meant to do with it? I'm I'm not going to. I can't just shy away and go. Oh. No, the, the court's wrong. The court's made the decision. I'll mm. accept that. But I'm not, based on the um, circumstances that I presented themselves at the time to me, um, I thought it was the right thing to do mm. to protect my lawful mm. interests. And uh, one thing that uh, yeah irks me about the whole thing is that uh, I made no effort to hide the fact mm. I recorded those conversations. So it's, yeah, I must be the world's dumbest crook <laughs> if uh, I've done something illegal and I let anyone in the police that uh, cares to ask mm. know that I've recorded those mm. conversations. So that, that in itself pretty stupid. Mm. But one thing that I, I would like to clarify too is that um, they've, the courts ruled that uh, I didn't record uh, the conversations to protect my lawful interests. But no one's presented an alternate hypothesis on why did I record those conversations. Taking away what Jason might say, I'm not this weirdo that uh, likes recording conversations. I didn't record the conversations and go home and listen to them. Yeah. Why, why did I record the conversations? Mm. So, mm. look, I'm uh, I'm proud of the work I did. Mm. I'm frustrated beyond belief on the impact it's had on uh, William Tyrrell's investigation. Mm. I, I think it's it's disgraceful. That should have been our primary primary concern. Um, I got no animosity towards the cops, mm. as you can see. You can see how I talk mm. talk to ex cops. I'm talking now. I I, I love my time mm. in in the cops. Um, we're public servants, and I think that should be what we're there for—to serve the public. And uh, the only issue I have is that people that put their own personal agenda above uh, above serving the public. And I think when uh, we derail an investigation of the nature of uh, William Tyrrell, uh, I, I'm not proud of uh, proud of the fact that that has been done. Mm. I think it's cool that we, you know, we, we had been working on this podcast for probably six months before we, we launched it and, and we, there was a lot of discussion about when we would release it and I think we decided at the last minute to release it almost immediately after um, your verdict because we at the at the paper and at, at our business knew that uh, that the public, there is a, a huge amount of public sympathy for and 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 an interest in you, and you know you're you're a popular figure in the public, and people, I think, have a much higher tolerance for what police do in pursuing a criminal than than others might think. You know, I think people would think if you're pursuing a pedophile, you know, you might be. Uh, doing a lot more than simply recording someone who who already had listening devices yeah, in their yeah, home, yeah. you know. And it's been interesting too that you've had a lot of, you know, victims' families and other and, and kind of crims reach out yeah. to you too. That kind of there's a new sense of brotherhood. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. you're on the you're on the wrong side of the law. Yeah, look, the the re reaction uh, from uh, yeah getting convicted of a, uh, a criminal offence has been astounding. My mum tells me she's proud of me, and I've, I've had to point out, no, mum, that's it's not good. But look, the public, and I, I do get uh, stopped in the street, and the the, the rhetoric that uh, comes out is that um, yeah, we're um, yeah, one hundred percent behind you. Mm. Yeah, you know, you're looking for a, a little kid. Their their perception is that I've, I've crossed the line and and gone further. I 
I push the envelope. I make. Um, I've got no problems with that whatsoever. But I don't break uh, break laws, mm. and uh, I don't uh, break the rules. But I I roll my sleeves up and have a real hard go. Um, One of the interesting things too about that I've learnt in in the process of working on this with you is that. Um, you know, I've heard you say a lot that a good detective has to bleed for the job. Yes. <clears throat> and I think right at the beginning I thought that that meant that you had to be so tough that you never let anything seep past the exterior, yeah. you yeah. know. But what I've learned from listening to you talking to the cops who you've interviewed for this series <clears throat> is that what you actually meant is that you have to open your heart and soul to, to it. You have to feel the the grief and the agony and, 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 and that's what you think is it, it makes a good detective, isn't it? Yeah, uh, look, uh, that... Empathy, and uh, yeah, if it had one characteristic that I'd say what I want in a detective is empathy, empathy for the victims, even the offenders. And uh, I think um, Dennis O'Toole, uh, one of the guests, is is a good example of, of that. Um, and you can see how he relates to people, and people gravitate towards him because he can communicate and he understands it. And uh, you get breakthroughs that way. But uh, yeah, look, and I maintain, and uh, especially in homicide, like there's a lot of areas within the police, all of which are important. But when you're uh, tasked with investigating the murder of someone's loved one, you it's not a nine to five job. And mm. if you want to go as a nine to five job, you're in the wrong uh, uh, wrong area. You should be working uh, working somewhere else. And uh, I take it very seriously. People say, and I know my naysayers have, have said, you know, too passionate and uh, yeah, just too too driven. That's not the case at all. Like it's passion with perspective mm. and uh, it, it's balance. But. Uh, I make, and I, I, I keep saying this because it's important that people understand what we're dealing with when we're talking murder investigations, that I make that commitment to the families, I'll do everything humanly possible. And uh, if I got to the point where I'm not doing that, I would walk away and, uh, and, and not put my hand up as a homicide detective. It's been interesting in the podcast interviews to hear you probing the other detectives for um, the cases that have kind of cut through a bit to their soul. You know, there's one I'm thinking of in particular right at the end yeah. who, you know, has seen some pretty heavy-duty stuff and, and has had to become very familiar with dead bodies and, and awful things. And uh, he, you know, he wouldn't acknowledge at all that, that any of it, you know, comes back in his nightmares. Or, yeah, yeah. You know... How do you? How have you managed that? You know, how yeah. have you managed all that 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 balance between not letting the the gruesomeness infect your life, yeah, and, and being tough enough to see it? Look, I I think there's um, you get conditioned to it. I, like I think that's yeah, you know, the person I am now is not the person I I was at the start of, start of my career. So you, you get conditioned conditioned to it. You also have a job to do, and I think you can distance yourself a little bit from what's happened, knowing that you're the person responsible for catching the person that's created this uh, this uh, terrible situation. So you can can focus on that. Yeah. Do I think about it at night? There, there's been certain investigations. Sometimes when you're just really invested in a, an investigation, you know, if if I'm looking into a pedophile crime, mm. I I become. Um, uh, and this is how it impacts on me. I'll, I'll get on a plane or a train or somewhere and I'll, I'll see someone that I think, that looks like a pedophile. It's mm. almost like I've got a, a, a radar. But that's me sort of overreacting. I did uh, one uh, particular um, uh, person that had like a Ned Kelly beard on and I interviewed him and it was a, a gruesome interview about uh, a murder he committed and then... Uh, uh, raping a child, and uh, for a long time I look at people with uh, Ned Kelly type beards, and I think grub pedophile, mm, and that, mm. that's just what I'm processing mm. processing in my mind. So it does have an impact. Um, there's been other times um, with the uh, Terry Falconer murder and the the spin off the Underbelly series, all those series of murders. There was a point there where I just when we started locking them all up and just dealing with all this uh, this pure evil. And uh, that uh, got me down a bit, mm. and sometimes you feel a little bit uh, dirty from it. And you would have had little kids at that stage, wouldn't you? Yeah. So you'd be coming back to this innocent, pure world at home, and then having to delve back into you know the darkest imaginable yeah. world of, of these murders. And you would, uh, and look, you could be, and um, you'd go to a family function or whatever, and you've just come from a murder scene, and uh, yeah, my my I was fortunate with my family; they'd give me give me space, and uh, I. I worked out. I, uh, I worked out how to deal with it in that I knew I wasn't in sync with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's how you came out. Like if I, and sometimes people might say, "Oh, yeah, he's he's quick to react or whatever." But when you're on a job, if you, you're doing an arrest or a murder scene or whatever, 
And if I'm in charge, I'm barking out orders. I need this done, that done. I can't muck around. Sometimes I've found myself taking that at home, as in <laughs> turn the TV off now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that type of thing. You're, you're overreacting. Um, each person deals with it differently. I was fortunate. I didn't that, n- never realised why I was really drawn to this years and years ago, but now after what's happened to me in the past 18 months, I think the whole thing has been to prepare me for what I've been going through. But I got into, uh, through martial arts, um, got into um, meditation and a, a thing called Qigong, which is similar to Tai Chi. It's sort of a, a moving yoga and, and yoga and, and all that. So I use that as my um, way of readjusting. Mm-hmm. So if I'm, I'm spun out from a job, as in uh, come carrying all that that burden of a, a pressure job, I can go home and uh, I can um, yeah chill out through doing my qigong or doing uh, meditation. Mm. And like I know the cops pay out on that, and the, yeah, twenty years ago they paid out on it even even more. But mm. people are starting to understand mind, mindfulness yeah. and uh, and the things that uh, can be achieved from there. And uh, it doesn't make you the most zen person in the world, mm. but it makes you more. Zen than you would be if you didn't have that. So mm. that's a tool that I've got. The other thing I do is um, a train, and uh, that yin yang balance helps mm. me. Like I like fighting, so I, I, I box and kickboxing and, and kung fu and that type of thing. So mm. it's amazing if you're uh, if you're feeling stressed at work and you step into a boxing ring and someone's beating you up. Mm. All the stress from yeah. work, all the stresses from work go. Is that just partly about being physically exhausted, or is it the the kind of having someone else order you around? But yeah, well, that's uh, that, interesting you sh- should say that because I had a um, particular sifu that I, I would um, see quite often and uh, and train. And, uh, Is that a sensei? Uh, yeah, sensei, sifu, yeah. <laughs> I, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Okay, guru, <laughs> someone you look up to, yeah. <laughs> a mentor. Yeah. Um, but I would go there and it was good, if, especially when uh, I was leading investigations because you, you, yeah, you're always telling people what to do mm. and it was good going to um, yeah, a, a, an environment where you're starting at the bottom run. Mm. And uh, I know I, I took uh, 12 months off over in uh, Perth. I spent 12 months over in Perth and I was doing some, uh, a lot of uh, kung fu over there. And I would go to this kung fu school and it um, the, was it, well, it was majority Asians, and uh, they would just beat the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I would come home better than Bruce. Yeah. But it was good. It was good for me. It was good for me mm. to take, um, yeah, uh, just forget my part of what I've been doing for my career and just have something like that. So I can't yeah, let you get away experiences. with talking about Perth without talking, <laughs> without talking about the lion dancing. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sorry. Why are you the laughing? The lion dancing. <laughs> now, I, Gary, I, I discovered about you know halfway through our, our relationship with Gary that he is an accomplished lion dancer. That's in L I O N. Yeah. Now I wouldn't say accomplished because I've got no musical skills or rhythm whatsoever. But how that how that played out with um, and this is not boot scooting at Tamworth. This <laughs> That's is what not, I thought it was yes, going to be. At this first. is the lion dancing in Chinatown with the dragons and and whatnot. So. Uh. So the, much more dignified. Much more dignified, especially when you're in the dragon's tail. Um, so over there, and uh, it, it was it was a strange time because I'd been so invested in the police, and I took twelve months off, and I was living over in uh, over in Perth, and uh, yeah, you've got to meet people and uh, and to make a life for yourself in a in a new environment, and because I wasn't working in a, a at that time. Um, I traded on my physicality, so I went to a, a boxing gym and uh, I made some good friendships. Uh, friendships there, and also a kung fu school. And the kung fu school, apparently, that one of the traditional kung fu schools, lion dancing is a very big thing. So we would, in between our kung fu classes, have to practice <laughs> lion dancing. Right. And then I think it was Buddha's birthday and the biggest celebration over in at Perth and uh, met at this uh, temple. And all the Kung Fu schools came from all, all around Western Australia to compete and they took it very, very seriously. Wow. And uh, at first they gave me the uh, symbols, you know, the, <laughs> the there, so that. But then I progressed. I right. progressed into the uh, dragon. Stupid round, drag- I couldn't be trusted in the, <laughs> yeah. the lion at this stage. At 100%. And what are you doing here? Then they put me in the tail of the dragon. <laughs> And I thought it was relatively fit, but when you're down on your haunches walking around in a in a lion, they never let me progress to the head. But 
Yeah, things like that. And my, my wife at the time, uh, Tracy, I, I called in at one stage and she could see the panic look on my, look on my face because I'm dressed in my kung fu outfit and about to go to the lion dance. Is that with those little slippers? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a go, great go, mental image of this. Go there and she's gone, what are you up to? And I go, I don't want to explain. And then she saw me with the pots and pans practising the cymbals. <laughs> Because anyone that knows me knows I haven't got a lot of musical rhythm. Um, so, yeah. But those type of things, yeah. that, I, I found that was a um, really good way to break away from mm. uh, from um, being in the in the cops. And I was also fortunate over there that uh, the boxing gym I went to and uh, someone that's a, a very good friend of mine, Dave Letitia, a uh, professional boxer, uh, he allowed me to work his corners at some professional fights. So I was living out the fantasy and... Uh, Tracy actually said to me, because I was training with them in the lead up to the fights, and said, you're not a professional fighter, Gary. And I said, well, I'm training with you because I come <laughs> home all battered and bruised and busted up. But, yeah, that was, uh, I think that, well, I say now extended my career, even though my career has been cut off. Mm. But that refreshed me. That mm. 12 months I, I had off refreshed me, and I couldn't wait to get back to work. And when I got back to work, um, one of the cases I took up then was the um, Matthew Levison matter. Oh, yeah. And... It was good because I had a lot of energy mm. and I, I'd refreshed and uh, I, I recommend it to anyone. I think they should encourage it. Like if you've got a demanding career, just taking that 12 months off, it mm. gives you perspective and, mm. uh, yeah, freshen, freshens you up. Mm. Okay, well, um, if podcasting and journalism don't work out, we know where your career will be he- heading. <laughs> yeah. I'll be seeing you at the Chinatown Parade. Well, they... Uh, because the kung fu school I was training with over there, the lineage was also a kung fu school here in uh, in Sydney, and they wanted me to do the um, right. lion dancing in Chinatown. <laughs> That's a big. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. No, not with all the detectives having lunch at the no, Golden no. Century. Yeah, how, how life changes <laughs> from sitting there drinking the Crown Lagers. But no, th- things like that, and I I, I enjoy that, and. Uh, I don't, people say to you only socialise with police and that. I'm, I don't socialise with police a lot outside of uh, mm. outside of work. I've got police friends that I, I catch up with yeah. regularly. But I think it's really good to um, step away from that because we talked earlier on about you know, the authority and the power. Mm. I think if you just mix with cops, it can give you a deluded sense about yeah, your role mm. in, uh, in things. So, mm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was okay. great. Well, I'm glad you've enjoyed it and hope you've got an insight. It's a bit harder being on this side. I prefer asking the questions. <laughs> I might do a podcast with you and find out how journalism. Oh, yeah. I oh. Just, I, I just on the last thing, yeah. just on, on journalism, yeah. I thought we were making big pressure decisions in the cops, like moral decisions and all that. But what I've seen in, in my small experience with journalism there's so many ethical decisions to mm. make in journalism. Mm. I, I really, I, I found that if someone asked me what what the difference is, it's all black and white when you're chasing a killer mm. and you know what you're doing. There's so many uh, decisions you you got to make. So, yeah, you've yeah. already had to counsel me through um, some serious sort of dark nights of the soul in in decisions that I've made that have of things that have gone really badly wrong. And um, you know, that's the, that's one of the things about journalism I, I've always found is is that um, we. You know, we put our we put our mistakes on page one. Yes. You know, there, there's very little to save us from from making mistakes, um, and uh, we're we are only human, and it, it, it does feel very high stakes when when something goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I I've, I've really I've noticed that the pressure the pressure on it. It's very public, isn't it? Yeah. If you stuff up, you you stuff up. Yeah, time, we're so. really exposed. You know, yeah. um, and and people are very quick to be critical, and you know, it's it's a it's. It's first grade, so yeah, yeah. you know we have to be we have to be up for that. But it's, you know, the, the, it's um, it's one of the other reasons I think that journo's a bit like cops, um, you know, drink a lot yeah. <laughs> and hang out together. Yeah, yeah because yeah. It, you know, it's a bit wearying to go to a party and get um, given a hard time about um, about what you do for a living. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel very lucky. We're we're, we're, um, we're to be working in the media and and right now during coronavirus actually what's happening is that people are turning to us even more than they ever have yeah, before yeah. you know they they're trusting us as a source of news um and they're really interested in in the, in the new things that we're doing like podcasting so yeah, you know yeah. it's a good time to be doing this yeah no, I, i'm i'm enjoying it so yeah it's not a dying industry oh, <laughs> that's good yeah that's good all right all right thanks gary thanks Glenn. I Catch Killers is published by True Crime Australia, produced by Claire Harvey from the Sunday Telegraph and Dylan Adams at Made in Katana. 
I'm now an investigative journalist at News Corp Australia, attached to the Sunday Telegraph. If you like the podcast, please subscribe to our newspapers.